Hello, everyone. We're ready to start. Our topic today is virtual lands. Virtual lands is a very weird thing that is completely widespread. We find it everywhere. We find it at TPFL. We find it in data centers. The idea is that for, there are reasons to be in the same local area network. For example, there are applications such as Google, um, iTunes, AirPlay, that work only in the same local area network. They don't cross uh, a router for scalability reasons. For also sometimes security reasons to reduce the perimeter of attacks, if some applications are available or some servers are accessible only by machines that are physically on the same local area network. Because of this practice, immediately comes a practical problem that people move, uh, the office allocation tends to be very agile, so you would not like to have such a physical limitation that in order to be able to do such a piece of work, you need to have your office in a place that is physically cabled to the same patch panel or the same switch. That is the motivation that has given rise to what is called a logical assignment of local area networks. Here I'm showing three areas, red, green, blue, that are connected to physically to different switches. And for some reasons, we want to organize things as three local area networks. That means from, from the viewpoint of IP, IP addresses and TTL, everything that refers to IP, all the systems that are in the red cloud are in the same local area network. When G sends a packet to C, for example, it is in the same LAN as usual, because there are only switches here. However, G cannot send a packet to B directly using MAC addresses, because G and B are not in the same local area network. Even though they are physically connected, the, if the switch supports virtual LANs, and if the switch has configured G and B to be in different virtual LANs, it will do as if they were physically disconnected. This is, this is handled by two things. First, you need through a network management console to log into the switches and configure uh, who belongs to which LAN. Typically, for example, because you belong to a certain lab of EPFL, you will be in the same local area network that this lab belongs to. And then your IP prefix, for example, will be determined by this. So you first, for each of the ports of the, of the, <coughs> of the switch here, you know where physically the wires are going, and then you allocate local area networks based on this. That's one method. There are also other methods that we won't discuss. Then there is a problem. When G sends a MAC layer packet to C, for example, this packet is reached by S3. Now S3 has to send it to C. The way this is done is that the virtual LAN switches, they have tables, bridge tables, that are separate for every virtual LAN. Tables and a spanning tree. So here there are three spanning trees that are very simple because the network is aligned. There is a red spanning tree, a blue spanning tree, and a green spanning tree. The green spanning tree is simple. There's only one switch that belongs to the green uh, virt uh, virtual LAN. The blue spanning tree spans S2 and S3, and the red spanning tree spans the three bridges here. And those are three separate spanning trees. How are they separated? Well, by what is shown on the right here, a VLAN label, which is four bytes, that is added to the uh, Ethernet packet uh, header. Uh, the VLAN tag is having, is having a the first two bytes are a special type that will indicate this is not a type field, but a VLAN tag. So there is a number. So the first two bytes are shown here. And the VLAN ID takes two bytes. So there is a number for the red, a number for the blue, a number for the green. When the switch receives a packet from the red here, the host does not know that on which virtual LAN you are. So this VLAN tag is not visible. If we do Wireshark on our computer, we will not see it. But the switch now knows this port is red. Therefore, I use the red bridge forwarding table and the red spanning tree. And before sending this packet, for example, if I need to broadcast it because I don't know where C is, I will broadcast it along the red spanning tree. I will insert this VLAN tag so that switch S2, when it receives this packet, no, that's a red packet, a packet of the red uh, virtual LAN. So by this use of tags, it is as if there were be physically different cables. But of course, there are not different physical cables here. 
let's see a small consequence of this. Assume we have here those virtual lands that I presented before, and I'm asking you in this poll, A is a packet to send to C, S1 is a virtual land switch. What should A do among the things that are presented here? I close the poll in a few seconds. Closing. And the majority says B, but this is incorrect. This is incorrect. The correct answer is a bit tricky. I mean, uh, admittedly, this was a bit uh, a tricky question, but A and C are on two different lines. They're on the same physical switch, but they're on different logical area networks. When A and C are not on the same LAN, they cannot communicate with each other by, by using MAC addresses. In order to communicate, they need IP. They need an IP router. So it's not possible. And that's the goal of virtual LANs, is to make it impossible. In particular, all the broadcasts, all the discoveries, all that thing will not work from A to C. So the hope is that there is a router if those two virtual lands need to communicate. If they don't need to communicate, they cannot. And sometimes that's the intention. If they need to communicate, you must have a router that is both present on the red and the green virtual LAN. And in order to communicate, they will need to go via a router here. Very often this router exists and is in the same machine as the switch. So this is sometimes called a virtual LAN switch that will do both the bridging function and the routing function. So there will be simply different pieces of software in the switch that will do it. Mm -hmm. But physically, A will need to first uh, send an R packet to the address of the router and also the, uh, it will not see what is the MAC address of C. It will receive a packet that comes from the router. That's the intention of the virtual LAN. A few more bells and whistles about bridges. Of course, the intention of bridges is twofold. One, to be able to extend the cabling by making it possible to have larger local area networks rather than connect uh, limited to a base station or to a bridge here. But also they can interconnect uh, systems that are physically different. For example, cable ethernet and Wi-Fi base station. It's possible to interconnect them using a bridge rather than a router, in which case, uh, everything will appear to be on Ethernet for the Ethernet machines. Everything will appear to be on Wi-Fi for the Wi-Fi machines here. Local area networks that are based on Wi-Fi uh, have a number of small additional complexities that I will quickly explain. If you do sophisticated wire sharks that show all addresses, you might see some additional MAC addresses. The reason is uh, given here. This is a traditional wiring, for example, the one that is uh, deployed at EPFL, for when you have multiple base stations uh, that are in the same Wi-Fi network, they are typically interconnected by what is called the distribution network, which is Ethernet. So the base stations are connected via Ethernet. And if we decide to bridge everything, if everything is on the same bridge network, uh, there is... Uh, there is uh, a small problem because the when A sends a packet to C, for example, from what we saw, the MAC source address is A, the MAC destination address is C, but the Wi-Fi access network requires, because of the RTS-CTS, that you send to the base station and the base station replies to you. So you need another MAC address, which is the one of the local base station. So there is a base station address or called an access point address, which is also present in the Wi-Fi MAC frames, which is not present at all in Ethernet. 
So when A sends a packet to C, it will send it with destination MAC address C and access point address, whatever is here, key, uh, E, for example. And same if it sends even to, to G, for example. Worse, in some cases, people had the probably bad idea, but it's deployed, to use Wi-Fi base stations as interconnection means. For example, you can have something that's sometimes called range extender. You have a base station M1 that has a given range, then it does not connect your entire domain, but it can be connected to a base station M2, which can be connected to M3, which can be connected to M4. This is sometimes used as a cheap way of extended uh, Wi-Fi. It doesn't work well because of the collisions. If you remember, when you're in a collision domain, uh, you can send only one frame at a time. So when A sends a frame to M1, uh, no one else can send within the range of M1. In particular, M2 cannot send probably when M1 repeats the frame, then M2 is blocked because there is sending frame from M1 to M2. And it's even possible that it blocks everyone uh, a bit further away here. So by having multiple transmissions of the same frame multiple times, you have a large number of collisions. So performance of that is very bad, but sometimes that's the only thing that works. And here, because of this, assume A sends a frame to B, source address is A, destination address is B, and this frame is relayed by M2 to M3, which acts as bridges here. So through the bridges, traditional things we've seen, M2 now needs to send it to M3. And here you need to have for the clear to send and ready to send exchange, you still need a source and a destination MAC address, which are given here. They are the transmit access point address and the receive access point address. So if we analyze a frame here, we will see source address A, destination address B, transmits, X, uh, transmits MAC address M2, to, uh, receive MAC address M3. Question? So the question is, isn't that violating the principle we saw last time that the bridge should be transparent? Here it is transparent. When A sends a packet to M1, you don't know whether M1 is directly connected to M2 or whether there is that whole stuff behind. So it's, it's transparent to M1. To, but if you do a Wireshark between M2 and M3, you will see different things. So small curiosities of the Mac layer. Let's conclude with this little question. Web server sent one IP packet to LA. So M1 sends a packet to M4. We do a Wireshark at point one. What is the destination MAC address we see here? I close the poll in a few seconds. Closing. And you see that the majority says D, which is the correct answer. That was a simple and easy check. Remember the bridges are transparent. So everything is the same as if M2 would be directly connected to uh, M4, for example, although it's not so common to connect a smartphone with Ethernet cable, but that exists. Let's skip now. A few words about security. Everything we said is completely unsecure. So there is a lot of problems that can occur, in particular, if we connect, if you come into some office and you see an Ethernet socket, you take an Ethernet cable and you connect there. If the system is unsecured and does only the things we've seen, you will be able to connect into that, which of course 
is uh, not sufficient. So, and, and it's worse, of course, on Wi-Fi. Therefore, there is typically an additional layer that does access control. For example, at UPFL on Wi-Fi, we do access control by uh, the authentication of your, uh, of your Gaspar account. And if you have a Wi-Fi base station at home, probably you have a simpler authentication, which is with a shared password. Anyone, anyone who knows the password can connect to your system. This is implemented, of course, by a special protocol and special exchange when you connect to the base station for the first time and is supported inside the packets by what is called MaxEC, uh, which consists in encrypting and authenticating the packets. So there is, in addition to everything we said, there is possibly a VLAN tag, there is possibly uh, an IP packet inside the payload. But before that, in many cases, at least on practically all Wi-Fi systems, there will be a special header that uh, is used to uh, specify what is a kind of encryption and authentication and a trailer that authenticates the packet here. And this authentication is real, is authenticating you when you connect for the first time. You means your device and the credentials you gave. For example, when you come to EPFL, you do a login and then your MAC address will be associated with you. And now you can uh, you can uh, the, the base station will be able to decrypt and authenticate the packets that you send and only if they come from you if someone else takes your machine or takes your tries to impersonate you by a different mac address then there will be problems question I didn't do it because I wanted to save time, but uh, M1 sends a packet to M2, to uh, M4. What is the destination MAC address? Would you, what's your guess? No, it's M4, it's the same. And this is all a local area network. So the destination MAC address in a local area network is the true MAC address of whoever receives it. Sometimes I skip a few quizzes when, when we don't have time, but their solutions are always posted in the solutions that I post after the lecture. So let's see this quiz here. Assume you connect to EPFL, and because you took this course, you know with the virtual box and your Linux machine, you know how to do bridging and lots of things here. So assume you give, you configure your machine uh, to be a bridge between you, so you connect with your PC, you configure a machine to be a bridge, and you connect a friend through uh, Wi Fi, for example, through a sorry, an Ethernet cable directly. Will it work? I close the poll in a few seconds. It's closing. And the majority says C, which is true. It should not work. We can try it. Because of MACSEC, when we authenticate here, the MAC address uh, is the MAC address of the Wi-Fi adapter of BART. And the base station here will make sure that the, the secret that is exchanged, that is created 
when there's the authentication phase here is used for decoding and applies to the Mac, to the Mac source packet that comes here from M1 only. When Lisa sends a packet, by the principle we've said, the bridge will not change the MAC address. So the MAC address will be M3. So the base station will see, oh, that's somebody who's tried to impersonate Bart. It's a different MAC address. It doesn't work. Fortunately, we can say we are well secured at TPFM. OK, now Bart, who took this course, wants to try another thing. Instead of configuring his PC as a, as a bridge, configures it as an app. Will it work? I close the poll in a few seconds. Closing. And the majority says B, which is true. It is true, unfortunately, for the security of EPFL. Because remember, when, when you put somebody behind the mat for the outside, there is no difference whether this is uh, something else on your PC. It could be a virtual machine on your PC, or it is some, someone else that is physically connected, or it could be another process on your PC because the NAT will obfuscate and, and will make everything appear as it would be different processes using different port numbers. So there's no way for the outside to know that Lisa is physically behind, or whether this is simply different things on your machine. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to give access to other people uh, who are not authorized to use EPFL. If you do that, you're liable for everything. This will be considered your access. Right? So everything that Lisa does, uh, Bart has to be responsible for it. Voila, that's all we will see today for the Mac layer. So the Mac layer, uh, is a bit underground. The Mac layer for wired medium has got rid of any protocol and uses bridges. We have seen uh, that the Mac layer in some sense is overlapping, is competing with the IP layer for interconnection. The idea being that the Mac layer is uh, using bridges that have, here I put routing tables, I should Somebody would kill me for that. I mean, the forwarding tables of bridges are not structured. So a bridge by nature has a much smaller scope. You cannot have a bridge with 1 million entries. So it's meant to be small and local. But you could also have with access control, you could have IP networks that are local in scope. So there is some, it's true, there is some overlap of function. But we have seen that uh, virtual LANs are used a lot. So LANs that appeared as a, uh, a result, a legacy, a result of the way things evolved from non-IP protocols and IP being there to interconnect everything, which is now long gone, except for a few industrial applications in a few corners. The whole world is using IP as the protocol to interconnect devices, uh, but the LANs are still there and they are used a lot, uh, in, in particular in the form of virtual LANs in enterprise networks. Perhaps not one reason for that, for the survival of LANs, is that they're independent of whether IPv6 or IPv4 is used. So uh, many people see it as a cabling mechanism, IPv4, IPv6 being a software mechanism. You change the version of software in your computer, you don't have to change the cabling, and that's the good news. But the, the routers, of course, are affected. You need to do something in your routers to support IPv6. For example, I've been asking for 10 years that we have IPv6 in the Wi-Fi network of EPFL. I was said yes last year, and this is still in deployment. So it seems to be like a huge thing. It takes uh, probably one year of work to the EPFL uh, system to deploy IPv6. Uh, whereas all the bridges, uh, all the pure cabling infrastructure 
uh, doesn't need any specific deployment. It works whether you use, uh, whether you want to support IPv6 or not, because the bridges don't see the IP addresses. Voila. That's all for Mac uh, layer. Without further transition, we move on to the next chapter where we jump the layers and we immediately go to the transport layer. By necessity, we spoke already of the transport layer, so we discover it a bit. Uh, the network, the transport layer exists in two flavors in TCP IP, strictly speaking, UDP and TCP, but we'll talk more about QUIC a, a bit later. But physically, QUIC is not located and uh, not physically in the sense of the uh, layer model is located above UDP. First thing to notice is there is no TCP V6 or UDP V6, just like there is no MAC V6 or MAC V4. Uh, the transport layer also is independent of the IP layer. So the details of UDP, the details of TCP were not affected when we moved from IPv4 to IPv6. However, the software is affected, of course, because if you write some software that is IPv4 only, then it's unable to use IPv6 addresses. So of course, moving from IPv4 to IPv6 requires a change of software. Hopefully all the systems that are around now have been updated to supporting IPv4 and IPv6. We've seen that UDP, like TCP, uses port numbers as a multiplexing mechanism, which is motivated by the fact that typically in a given system, there are multiple things that are happening, multiple tasks. In the simplest form, we can think of them as processes, but also a single process can use multiple ports. Here, for example, I have a process that is the DNS resolver that is trying to find what is the IP address that corresponds to a given DNS name. When it sends a query to a DNS server, it uses a given port number that is allocated temporarily by the operating system to this process. And this is, of course, is used by the DNS server that receives a packet that has source port 1267 in order to, when it, the DNS server replies to this machine, it will put destination port 1267. And then the host here, when it receives this message, it knows it is for this process here, because there might be other processes that are using UDP with other port numbers. For example, you might be doing uh, interact Zoom with interactive uh, audio or video that for, in some cases, uses UDP, for example. So we have port numbers as a way to distinguish several uses of UDP and TCP, and we are well familiar with them. We see that they play a role everywhere um, that is independent of this intentional idea. The, as we know, the port numbers are used by NATs to cheat uh, with, uh, with things. Other than putting port numbers, UDP is essentially doing nothing. So UDP is adding a source and a destination port numbers. Each of them are 16 bits. It adds also a primitive checksum, which is meant as a as a uh, relatively simple error detecting code, and also message length, uh, in case in particular there would be some padding here. So UDP is really the minimal transport layer. In fact, we never use IP natively. If you want to use the IP packet here, the, we can view UDP as being the simplest way to use IP. I mentioned a DNS server and a DNS resolver. What is exactly the definition of the word server?
I close the poll in a few seconds. And the correct answer in the context of UDP and TCP is the answer D, is the role of a program that waits for requests to come. If you want to have two machines to communicate together, you have a bootstrap problem. You, one of the two must be waiting for the other to speak. So the alternative is you quickly go to one machine, you press the on button, you press the on button on the other, and but that's of course not practical most of the time. So client server, is the only way we have found to make two machines communicate. One starts a program that waits for messages to come, and the other, whenever it's ready, sends a message. So it's a role. Of course, we have also things that are called peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer means that the different machines play both roles in parallel. They are client for some, they are servers for others. Of course, all those words are also words that are used in real life. A machine that is used in the web is often called a server. But the reason for it is that it comes from this thing here. A DNS server is truly a machine that is waiting for you to send DNS requests to it, which means it is running in the background. It is always running, as opposed to the client that can go to sleep when it has nothing to send. UDP being the simplest possible mechanism still does a little more work than simply giving access to IP packets. It does what is called fragmentation. UDP allows you to send one message that is larger than one IP packet up to a maximum length, which is today by default 64K, this number of bytes here. And UDP is message oriented. That means when you use UDP, when a client sends a message to a server using UDP, it does one call to the UDP socket. And when the server receives, it knows that what it receives is the entire message that was sent here. That looks obvious, why would things be different? But we will see that TCP doesn't do it in this way. TCP will use what we call a streaming service. And when you, on the server side, when you call and you, when you receive messages from TCP, perhaps what you receive is only 10% of the message if the message was too long here. UDP never allows that. We say it's message oriented, which means that for the application, there is no need to have format instructions. When you go to a web server, you always need to agree what is the format of the file that you're receiving. So that's part of the HTML messages. You have a MIME header to say what is coming and when. And so all of this stuff you need because you never know when the file starts and when it ends, when an image starts and when it ends, for example. With UDP, in principle, you don't need that. And also, if a message is larger than the possible maximum size, we'll talk it about a bit later, then UDP will break it into, uh, sorry, fragmentation will occur at the IP layer, which means UDP will accept a packet that is larger than the maximum packet size, but will pass it to the IP layer, and the local IP layer will break it into several packets. We'll talk about that in detail uh, in a few more weeks. Uh, right now, what we should remember is that there is in some sense a decoupling from the true packet size, which is 1500, and the, uh, in most cases, and the maximum message size here. How do we use UDP in practice? Well, there are many, many frameworks to use it, but most of them are imitating what is called the socket library, which is the original library developed in C for giving access to the TCP and UDP services. So if you are here, I'm showing a client that wants to send a message to the server. So both the client and the server need to create a socket. The socket is like a local port, is something that allows you to send and receive from. It's the same thing you do. It's very close to what you do when you want to write or read from a file. You need first to uh, create a file descriptor. So here you create a socket. Here, this is using the Python uh, syntax here. And when you when a server when you're a server, uh, you do what is called a bind. Bind means you say which server port you are listening to. When you're a client, you don't care typically because the port does not have any meaning for you. We've seen that as a client, you receive a temporary port number that is used only to know whom to send it back to. But you don't know this port number. Most of the time, we don't care. When I go to a DNS server, I don't know which port number is allocated to me, and it is not important for me to know. But I need to know that the DNS port server is 53. If the DNS port server is on 52, 
which is possible, but would be wrong because 53 is reserved for DNS. But if you try to do it and if you have enough privileges on your operating system, you can do it, then it could be wrong. So the nature of the client server uh, system is that the server port must be well known. Otherwise, the client will never know how to go there. So you know, since it's well known, we don't leave it to the operating system to give us a number. We ask the operating system to connect us to a given port number, which is done here by this instruction. Once this is done, you do a receive call, which is like reading from a file. If nothing has arrived, then this is a blocking call by default. So the server hangs and waits for something to come. If there is a client that is sending, the client will do will also create a socket, will not bind. Uh, in C, we need to bind explicitly, but in uh, higher level object oriented languages, the bind is done by default here. If you don't do that, then you, you get whatever is given to you by the operating system. And then you send a message. UDP is connectionless. Connectionless by default means that you can send to anybody, which is visible here in the type of primitive that is used. We say send to. Send to means we have at least two arguments to give, the message we're sending and the address, the destination machine, uh, IP address, and the destination port number. So you send to a given server, port 53, for example, here. Hopefully this guy will receive it and hopefully will do more. But if that's if your goal was only to send and die, then you can simply die after a number of send and then you close the socket. You need to close because any resource that is not closed properly might still be consuming some resources or might be memory leakage uh, if you uh, don't close things properly. So this is how this would be the, the most simple uh, interaction that we can think of. I mentioned that UDP does not depend on V6 or V4, but there is still some dependency. And this dependency is whether you decide that when you create a socket, you have to decide whether it's an IPv4 or an IPv6 socket. Because the an IPv6 socket will use IPv6 addresses and IPv4 will use IPv4 addresses. We will say there is an intermediate in a second, but as a first statement, uh, a socket needs to be uh, to be uh, v4 and v6. And one simple way to do it is to, uh, at least in high level uh, languages like in Python, is to detect from DNS whether the destination, for example, if I want to connect to this machine, I can go to DNS here by this call here that is part of the socket library. This is how we go to the DNS, get address info. If I go to, I, I use this call with this uh, string here, the name of the server, then I will receive from the DNS server the addresses if they exist. And if there is an IPv6 and an IPv4 address, then I can choose whether I create an IPv6 or an IPv4 uh, socket. If for it, so I can parse this and see whether I have received an IPv6 address, then I will choose IPv6. Many systems will do that. If I don't have an IPv6 address, I will resort to IPv4. If you choose an IPv6 socket, at least there is one good news in the interconnect interworking of IPv6 and IPv4. There's one thing that is simple, is this one, it's the only one. An IPv6 socket is able to work with IPv4. Right, so not by default. Many systems don't like it by default, but with a bit of working, with setting the option properly, you can use an IPv6 socket on a dual stack machine. I say it can work with IPv4. Still, the socket works, but working with IPv4 means you receive an IPv4 packet. If you receive an IPv4 packet, that means you have an IPv4 connection. That means you are a dual stack machine. You have both IPv6 and IPv4. In this case, if you receive, if somebody sends to you to your IPv4 address, I mean, you have two, an IPv6 and IPv4 address. If someone sends to you to this address and to this port number, so this socket is bound to this address and to that address, and because it's with this option, we, bound it, we bind it to both and to a given port number, then you will be able to receive. 
Of course, an IPv6 socket views the world as IPv6 addresses. So we need to map IPv4 addresses into the space of IPv6 addresses, which is a trivial problem because the space of IPv6 addresses is much larger. So there is a, a, a reserved prefix, which is this one here, lots of zeros followed by 16 bits equal to one that gives this prefix here. And this is a prefix length of 96 bits because we have then just enough bits to write an IPv4 address. So when this IPv6 socket will receive an IP packet that comes from the source address 1234, IPv6, IPv4 address, it will believe it comes from an IPv6 machine that has this address here. So this is the format called IPv4 mapped IPv6 address. There are multiple mapping of IPv4 and IPv6, so it's one of them. The IPv4 mapped IPv6 address means it's an invalid IPv6 address. There is no interface that has this address, but it's a valid IPv6 address in the context of a socket that receives something. And it means it's really coming from an IPv4 machine, not from an IPv6 one. So that's uh, something that will facilitate if you deploy something on a dual stack machine, then you can write IPv6 sockets only. How does the operating system use UDP? Typically sockets are implemented in the operating system. They're also implemented on systems on a chip, but in, uh, in uh, Linux or uh, Macintosh or Windows, this is how they are viewed. So uh, the IP layer and UDP are all processed by the operating system. When an IPv4 packet comes from an ethernet interface, for example, we know from the ether types and IPv4 packet, the destination address gives us uh, to which part of the operating system it goes, because sockets have to bind to given addresses. If there's only one IP address, then it's simple, but many um, machines have multiple interfaces. You can choose to bind a socket to one address. That means you can choose to receive packets that go only to your ethernet uh, adapter and not to your Wi-Fi adapter, or to any, uh, if the default is any. So a socket here, which is a, as a first approximation, simply a buffer where the packets are held before being sent or received here. When a packet comes with this port number, for example, it's delivered to this socket buffer. When the packet comes to the same IP address, but a different port number, it's put with a different buffer. And in principle, there's only one socket that can access a given port number here. If you try with another socket to access the same port number, uh, there will be, uh, at least for UDP sockets, there will be, uh, there will be a, a problem and it will not return. Then there is a buffer. Why is there a buffer? Well, on the sending side, when you send, because by the time the application writes, the packet is not instantly delivered through ethernet, for example. So we need to buffer it so that the rest of the machine has time to transfer. Typically things are paralyzed. It's not a single loop that empties the buffer on the ethernet card. This is delivered to the ethernet adapter and the ethernet adapter is perhaps busy sending something else. So you need a buffer here. If the buffer is full, when you try to write, then you will have a return code that will be a negative one. There will be an error case. You're not able to write because the buffer is full or the call is blocking, depending on whether you choose your socket to be blocking or non-blocking. On the receiving side is the same for the same reason, but converse, when a packet comes, the application is not necessarily reading it immediately. Perhaps your application does an active loop and does its work. When it's finished doing its work, it tries to see if something is present in the buffer. If nothing is present and the socket is blocking, then the application thread that has called the socket read is blocked. Until a packet comes, the packet is delivered and the thread uh, resumes its execution. When we have a dual stack IP socket, then uh, we have a, a path that allows uh, IPv4 packet to go to IPv6 socket. But other than that, uh, this is uh, the only thing. Um, yes. That's what I mentioned here. Uh, no. I mentioned here in those words, I used the, the <coughs> I mentioned here, uh, all the sockets I gave here are what is called non-connected sockets. 
which is the default behavior of an IP of a UDP socket. A non-connected socket is a socket that allows you to send to any remote machine and to receive from any remote machine. So the calls you do to use that socket is send to and receive from. For some reasons, you may want to limit the scope of a given socket. You may want to create a socket that allows you to send only to a given machine. You might do that when you have a long interaction. Obviously, you don't do that when you send a request to a DNS server. But if you do a long video session, you might decide to send to restrict this socket to being used to a given remote destination, IP address, and port. When you do that, we say that the socket is connected. There is no physical connection that occurs between the two remote machines. It is simply that locally, you can use now this socket by doing a send or a read. You don't need to do send to, you don't need to pass as argument whom you're sending to. The argument is cached into the socket. That is what is called a connected socket. And the difference here is when an IP packet comes to a connected socket, it will be delivered to this socket only after screening the source IP address and the source port number, which is an additional uh, filtering mechanism that is often used in servers. Well, we'll do a break and we will we'll resume in 15 minutes. After discussing UDP, we move on to TCP, which is considerably more complex because TCP because TCP is taking care of repairing packet losses. In the internet, packets may be lost. Why can packets be lost? Why would you build a system that loses packets? Seems like a weird thing to do. Well, we try hard not to lose packets. Yes, question? Because physically you cannot avoid this, exactly. So it's a failure of trying hard. So when you do the physical layer, for example, of a cellular network, the physical layer tries to does what is called channel uh, estimation, tries to estimate what is exactly the noise and the, and the transfer function of the channel. And we use a coding scheme that is adapted to the channel such that with high probability, the packet will not be lost. But this is physical world. In physical world, things are not digital. They're not, they're never certain. There's always a probability that things fail. So this probability is very small on even on wireless systems, but it may fail. Now on some wireless systems, this is compounded by mobility. If you move around, then the channel estimation is a quasi impossible job. You can estimate the channel now, but you move and you come to a different location, then the channel is a bit different because the reflection is different because somebody opened the door, etc. So even if you estimate very well, it may be difficult to do. So losses, message losses on transmission channels are inevitable on wireless channels, though they are fairly rare. Also, we've seen that the Mac layer, when it's Wi-Fi, has an acknowledgement. So if a packet is lost between a and the base station, for example, the absence of acknowledgement will cause A to send it again. So the Mac layer is trying very hard to deliver packets without losses, but it's not absolutely impossible. Also, there is a problem that we will discuss considerably more in a few more weeks, buffer overflow. The internet and from bridges to routers to information servers is a huge queuing network. So you have packet that comes that are queued we have seen an image of a, of a bridge. A bridge receives packets on input ports and delivers them to the output port. And there are queues everywhere. There are queues because, for example, if you're an intermediate machine, bridge or router that has 1,000 inputs and 1,000 outputs, it is possible that at a given point in time, there are 1,000 packets coming from 1,000 inputs that all want to go to the same output. In fact, that happens a lot because tends to be, things tend to be highly asymmetric in terms of uh, distributions in the internet. So, of course, if that happens, at least 99, 999 of the packets must wait. So they're put in the buffer. Then if you do that once, there's no problem. But what if that happens repeatedly? Then the buffer will grow and might overflow. So buffer overflows do happen and do happen a lot in the Internet because of that, because of congestion. So those are the congestion losses. 
there are systems like industrial networks that forbid this. If you send a command from a control center to a robot in an autom automated factory, and the instruction is move the arm by three degrees, uh, you don't want this packet to be lost because there was overflow, because somebody was doing watching YouTube on the same infrastructure. Of course, you don't want this to happen. So the, in industrial networks, there are specific mechanisms where congestion losses are forbidden. But that gives rise to radically different things. In the internet, none of the internet is doing that. Industrial networks are, real-time networks are doing it, but the internet is not doing it. Well, so we'll see that there are losses, and those losses must be, uh, must be repaired here. So if you use UDP, you have to handle that. If you connect to, if you ask a question to a DNS server, what is the IP address of this machine? You send a single message. It may be this message will be lost because of congestion, because of all the reasons we said. But since you're waiting for an answer, you will time out. So you emulate what we call the stop and go protocol. You send a message. Uh, it's more than just an acknowledgement. You want also the answer to your question. If the answer doesn't come after some time, we'll send it again. And if it doesn't come, you will send it again and again. And after a number of times, you will give up. If you do that at the application layer, of course, that makes your application considerably complex. So the idea of TCP is to do it once for all, such that as a programmer, you don't have to do it at all. So as a programmer using TCP, you can assume packets are not lost. Of course, you should not be naive and believe in, in the two beautiful things. It may still happen that things go wrong. Because for example, if you connect to a server, somebody cuts the wire or disconnects the server, the server was transferring a video to you, the wires are cut, uh, then the transmission will not continue. TCP will not be able to repair something that is bro physically broken. So TCP, when we say TCP offers a reliable service, that means it offers everything that can be done by the software to repair the losses is done by, T by TCP. So you don't need to do it. But you might still want to catch the case when it breaks. That, for example, if your file is not transferring after some time, it probably means the connection is broken means you don't have to worry about sending a packet again or something. You probably need to stop and start again in some time later. So that's what TCP does. How does TCP do it? Well, it numbers the data per byte and it offers what is called an in-sequence lossless delivery of packets. In-sequence is something additional. In-sequence means that for example, if a server sends you a video file, that's many, many packets and many, many bytes. That's hundreds of thousands of bytes. The server will put them in the pipe with a given order. Now, if there are multipaths in the internet, when we talk about the routing protocol in a few more weeks, we'll see that that's a very common thing for reliability in particular. So we have very often multiple paths from A to B. So it may be that all packets don't reach you in exactly the same order as they were sent because the queues on the different paths are random, they're not necessarily always the same. So there may be a slight misordering of the packet and TCP will correct that for you. TCP will not deliver you the bytes in the order that they receive, like UDP does. If you use UDP to do a video streaming application, which you do when we want, you want very low delay video streaming application, then if the server sends you 1000 packets and they arrive in a different order, UDP will deliver them in the order that they arrive. It will be up to the application to reorder the video, which is typically done by a video playback uh, buffer. You put them in the buffer at the place where they belong. With TCP, you don't need to worry about that. TCP will do it in its own buffer. So TCP guarantees that the data that are delivered to you are delivered in exactly the order in which they were sent by the application. Today, we might wonder why we do this. That seems a bit weird. Uh, the reason is that when TCP was developed in the 70s, there were many protocols and many, the computers were, there were few computers, the networks were small. So there were lots of cases where two computers were connected directly at the Mac layer. And the Mac layer, if you remember, it started as physical wire. And when we put bridges and everything, it should be the same as if you would be physically connected. A and B being connected by a direct Ethernet cable or by a network of bridges is the same. In particular, the Mac layer always preserves sequence. By nature, if we have a network of bridges, we have a spanning tree. 
So we have only one path from A to B, so the packets cannot bypass, cannot overtake each other. So the MAC layer and the physical wires, by physical nature and by the spanning tree in the case of bridges, automatically deliver a sequence. And TCP was meant as a software emulation of that. <coughs> With TCP, we get the same as if the two applications were connected over physical wires, which for some reasons was a requirement in the 70s, does not appear to be a requirement today. Today, if you do video streaming for YouTube, perhaps it's convenient for the video reader to know the applications come in order, but since the video reader will anyhow need to put them in a playback buffer in order to do lots of things, like because of the timing, the video needs to be played at a given time, right? You don't deliver when the frames come. You, you recreate exactly the speed, uh, 25 frames per second, regardless of uh, whether the 25 frame came in the same second or not. So you have a playback buffer. So having a playback buffer means, it gives you a simple means to reorder packets if they come out of order. And there is video that works over UDP when you have hard real-time constraints. So today would seem as a bizarre requirement, but it was important in the 70s, and we still have it today. And it's important to remember it because that's the only TCP we have. So the TCP we have delivers data in the order, which means that if for some reason you're delivering 10,000 packets and packet two is lost, and because of massive parallelism in the network, all packets except packet two is lost, then TCP will deliver only packet one to you. The, all the thousands of other packets that are here, but are out of order, TCP will do as if they had not arrived. Of course, TCP will not drop them, will keep them in its buffer, but the application will not be able to consume them. To do its job, TCP does exactly what we presented a few weeks ago, the stop and go protocol. It waits for an acknowledgement for every packet, but contrary to the stop and go protocol, TCP will allow, will not, not do stop and go, it will allow to send multiple packets before waiting for acknowledgements. Since it sends multiple packets, it needs to know which acknowledgement is for what, so the acknowledgements are numbered. And since TCP is delivering a streaming service, the numbering is per byte. So a TCP acknowledgement is saying, here are the bytes that were received. Here is an example. On the left, I show A that is sending packets to B. The first packet is sent, it has 500 bytes, which is given by this uh, uh, sequence numbering range here. Then the acknowledgement sent by B will say, I acknowledge all those bytes, but the default acknowledgement in TCP is, is giving only the upper end. When I send, I am acknowledging this number, that means everything up to this number has been received properly. This semantic is to be uh, understood because when TCP was done, the idea was to emulate a wire that does never disorder its packets. So this is uh, how things work. We will see in a few, in one minute that of course that's not, we're also able to acknowledge more sophisticated things, but what is called the acknowledgement field in TCP has this semantic. It, it means everything up to this number has been received. When I say up to this number, the number that is here is excluded. So it means everything up to 8,500. Now the application sends three more packets. Two of them are lost for whatever reason with, uh, you see, increasing sequence numbers. Then when B will receive this second packet here, it will send an acknowledgement, but the acknowledgement will be for this number. It has received here a block of data, but it is out of order. It will not in the acknowledgement say this here. Now, sooner or later, we will see that if in a more sophisticated version, there's another field that will allow to signal that this has been received and not that, but the acknowledgement field itself does not give more information. Assume for some reason, the acknowledgement is lost. That can also happen. An acknowledgement is in fact a TCP packet. It can also be lost here. Then uh, sooner or later, this packet that has been sent here is associated with the timeout. So like the stop and go protocol, everything is like the stop and go protocol with the exception that we allow parallel packets to be sent. Here we've sent three packets. The stop and go protocol after sending packet three would stop here. But here we were allowed to send more packets here. Of course, sooner or later we will time out. When we time out, we look at what has been received, everything up to this packet. So we will retransmit this packet. 
Now, when this packet is received, then it will be delivered here. And uh, here we see also that um, the, the, this packet will be delivered, then it's acknowledged. And uh, after being acknowledged, and uh, the other packet will also be sent. Okay, so nothing fancy. That's the basic operation of TCP. And that is how the first TCP was. Now, very quickly, people realize, yeah, but the reality is a bit more complex. The two A and B are not connected over a single physical wire, but over a network that may disorder packets. So it may be that we lose uh, some packets and we, uh, or even disorder them, and we may need to do what is called selective acknowledgement. So a great invention of the 80s was to add a more sophisticated semantics to this. Seems completely trivial today, but this is, was not done at the beginning. Of course, what would happen in a case like this, the acknowledgement would combine the, this field here. So the way it's done is the acknowledgement field, as before says, of everything up to that number has been received. Then I have, but I've received more. And here I'm indicating that I have received this block here. Now, when I receive this, when A receives this uh, acknowledgement here, a knows that this first packet has been received, but also the packet sent at line five has been correctly received. So A is able to repair the loss by sending a packet that is merging packet three and four. Here we can merge because those are relatively short packet, 500 bytes, the maximum size for an IP packet is around, depending on uh, various details of the protocol, is around 1500 bytes. So we could put three of them in one IP packet. Here we did only one. Why did we do only one? Well, perhaps because the application was creating 500 bytes only. So we send as soon as we can or as soon as it's reasonable to send. But if we need to repeat, there's no reason to send two packets if it fits in one. So we send them in one packet. This is a side effect of the fact that TCP offers a streaming service. TCP doesn't care about how the application decided to break the sending into sending events. So here the application has done four sending events at line one, three, four, five. With UDP, it would be important to preserve that. So with UDP, it is important that the destination receives four different things because the application has done four different messages. With TCP, we say no, TCP is offering a streaming service so when the, when the destination receives, the destination receives, in fact, three packets. The application has done four writes, but the destination receives three packets. Those packets are put in the receive buffer of TCP, and they can be delivered here. Then once this is received here, we see there is no loss. So the acknowledgement that is sent here uh, acknowledge everything. There's no need for a SAC block because now everything is continuous. So this is very simple. This is what you need to do when you depart from stop and go and allow to send more than one outstanding packets. And you, have, you allow to continue to send. Here you send at line five, even though some things were lost here. Now, of course, if you do this, you need a receive buffer because, for example, when we see here, this packet has been received here. It is not delivered to the application, but it is, of course, present here. So you will keep it in the buffer. So packets uh, may need to be resequenced because TCP requires to deliver things in sequence. And also, they may need to be stored until they are made visible. Therefore, TCP needs a receive buffer that is part of the default setup of a socket. In a TCP socket, we specify. By default, we don't specify, but if we want to play, that's the socket buffer size. Now, if we do just what I said, if we depart from stop and go by allowing multiple transmissions, we immediately hit a problem. The problem is illustrated here. There are many reasons for this problem to occur. Here's a very simple explanation. By allowing multiple packets to be sent, you may very quickly overflow the receive buffer. Here is an example. I send a packet, then it's lost. I use P0 instead of the byte numbers because that makes the story shorter, but think of them as a shorthands for byte numbers. Then 
I send P1, P2, they are received, they're stored in the buffer. I send a number of packets, then assume I lose P0 again. And perhaps I, that can happen multiple times. Then if I multiple times lose the same packet, this packet is preventing all the other packets from being delivered. And so the buffer will have to contain more and more packets. So if we do just this, the source, of course, is continuing to do its thing. Perhaps that's a video packet and the sources continue to uh, send packets or you're transferring a big file here. Then there is a problem in the size of the buffer here. So we need to find a way to stop the source from doing that. If P0 has been sent, has been lost multiple times, you want to say to the source, but stop sending to me because my receive buffer is full and there's no point you sending me data because I would discard it because my buffer is full which is the most stupid way of losing a packet. It has traversed the whole internet, it reaches the destination server, and bing, the socket buffer is full. So that's a stupid thing. We need to avoid this. The first element to avoid this is to use what is called a sliding window. So a sliding window is a very common thing we find in all protocols, and here it's illustrated with TCP. The window size with TCP is in number of bytes. To simplify the story here, I assume every packet are 1,000 bytes, so the window size is four packets. Here, TCP will always have a given window size. We will see how the window size is decided by TCP. Assume for a second, here it's 4,000 bytes. So we do like stop and go, but we allow only a window of 4,000 bytes. In a nutshell, that what it means is that's the maximum number of bytes that can be outstanding, that can be non-acknowledged. So the only seconds numbers that are in the window may be sent, and the window changes when we receive acknowledgement. So here, we are allowed to send three packets, so we send them. When I receive, when I don't receive an acknowledgement, I, for example, if I would be able to send those four packets, one, zero, one, two, three, instantly, then I could send them instantly, but I could not send packet four. I can send only four packets, zero, one, two, three. In order to be able to send more, I need to move the lower sign of the, the lower edge of the window, and the lower edge of the window comes when we have acknowledgement fields, when everything is acknowledged, everything, not selective acknowledgement, but cumulative acknowledgement. For example, here, when the first packet A equals zero is acknowledged, then the window moves and I can send one, two, three, four. We see here, this is what I'm doing. I'm sending all of these packets here, and then I receive one acknowledgement, so I can send one more, the window moves, but here I have sent four packets that are all in the window, two, three, four, five were sent, and none of them were acknowledged, and it, sorry, I should not say none of them, the lower, in order to move the window, I need to receive an acknowledgement for packet two. As long as packet two is not acknowledged, the window cannot move here. So here I'm blocked. This is how I, by this window size, if the window corresponds to the size of the receive buffer here, then I'm blocking the sender, which is exactly what I want. If the sender has not sent acknowledgement, perhaps it means uh, it's busy receive, processing them, or there has been repeated losses, like we said before. In order to move things, I need to receive the acknowledgement from number two, which is here. And we see here a mode of operation where the rate at which we send packets is exactly the rate at which we receive acknowledgements. And we see that the window moves by one at every acknowledgement that is received and the source sends exactly one packet. In fact, we illustrate here exactly what the window is doing. It is uh, controlling the rate of the source here at to be exactly the rate at which the destination is receiving acknowledgements, which is presumably the rate at which the application is consuming data. So we have a way to do what is called flow control. We control the source. We make sure the source sends at exactly the rate at which we are able to absorb. Not exactly, there is a small margin because we could send four packets together at a time, but this margin is limited. So that is the sliding window. The important thing to remember is for the window to move, we need to acknowledge everything up to the first element of the window. So a little quiz, at time T1, here in this scenario, is the sender allowed to send a packet so that would be packet four?
I close the poll in a few more seconds. Closing. And the correct answer is B, as you can see, is the majority answer. The rule of the sliding window says we need everything up to packet uh, zero to be uh, we need that all, all, all numbers that are below the window have been acknowledged. So here there has been some acknowledgements, but we must wait for packet zero to be acknowledged before because that makes four packets. The lower side of the window is still stuck at zero here. And we see the effect on the receive buffer. Packet one, two, three are present. Uh, packet zero might as well be in the buffer, but not yet consumed by the application. So we see that the window size is in fact exactly corresponding to the worst case that can be held in the buffer. So by controlling the window size, we can match the socket buffer size. Now that's not the only thing of the story. In principle, a window was developed to protect the buffer, but it's not sufficient. We need something else. Because there is still the problem of the packets that are lost, and we've seen that if we have repeated loss, packet zero being lost repeatedly, that may cause the receive buffer to, to, be, to become larger and larger. But there's another reason for congesting the receive buffer. It is if the application that consumes the data is very slow. And of course, that can happen a lot because we don't control the speed at which an application is reading from a socket buffer. So assume you send data here and they are properly acknowledged. So I have a window, for example, of four, and then like before, there is no loss. So I can continue sending because there is no loss. here. Right. Everything is acknowledged, it's fine. Then, but the application is busy doing something else. So it reads one and then it waits a long time because we're reading more. Then the, all the packets will need to be stored in the receive buffer and we have again the same problem. So what is the solution to that? Well, an uh, immediate solution would be perhaps to not send an acknowledgement when the data, send the acknowledgement only when the data has been consumed by the application. <coughs> that would be a way, and some systems do that. Some low level hardware system do that. They send the acknowledgement only when the, uh, the, the data has really been consumed by the application. But that tends to be very simple systems in uh, data in uh, data centers or for TCP IP uh, servers, it's not a good idea because the machine, the computer here is very complex. The packet has been received correctly. So if you delay the acknowledgement, you give wrong information. The acknowledgement is here to give information about what has happened on the channel. Was the packet lost or not? The packet was not lost. So if you delay the application for 10 minutes because the application is very slow, of course, the source will deduce that the packet was lost here. It, and we will see that is used, for example, by congestion control. So that's a bad idea. That's not what is done. Instead, what is done is to constantly adapt the size of the window by sending a field that is called a window advertisement uh, back to the source here. So in the case that was given before, the destination would instruct the source by sending, now I'm congested, window equals zero. So I stop the, the source here. So the size of the window with TCP is constantly adapted to the available part of the receive buffer. 
what is the available part? Well, we, we can see it on this figure here. Here, I'm assuming, again, uh, the same story as before, but now we see that when we send in the return channel an acknowledgement, at the same time, we send the size of the window. Here, the window is two, uh, which is illustrated by here, so I can send packet zero and one and I will send an acknowledgement, the window is two. And then for some reason, the window becomes four, which means I can send more. And here we see at the point, the receiver is sending window zero. That means it's a stop signal. Why would we be doing this? Well, we can discover here why we would be doing this. Here I'm showing on the right, the receive buffer. The dark blue is data that is in the receive buffer but and was not consumed by the application and the light blue is free space in the buffer so those packets here minus two and minus one have been received and act but they are uh, they are still sitting in the buffer so they're congesting the buffer so from the viewpoint of the sliding window uh, i have space for only two which is what i will do by sending a window of two and here there is a time where the socket buffer is full so the application is slow, could not consume all the data, then we will send a window of zero, which will effectively prevent the source from sending more, and therefore will prevent the buffer overflow at the destination. Of course, if you send a window of zero, it's equivalent to sending a stop signal to the source. You should be careful. What are, what are the nasty things that could happen? Well, you could, the window of zero is unblocked by the next ACK here, which is window four. What happens if this message is lost here? Well, if this message is lost, then this one doesn't send anything. Since it doesn't send anything, this one doesn't ACK anything. There's also no reason to reply because you're sending nothing to me. So we have a deadlock. The source is blocked because it was not receiving the correct window update. And the destination doesn't reply anything because the source is not sending anything. So of course you need to catch this deadlock. As usual, the only universal way of catching deadlocks that works easily is by timers. So you allow, once you receive a window of zero, you start a timer, TCP will start a timer. And when the timer expires, it is allowed to send one byte of information. So if you have a window of zero, once in a while you will still send one packet with one byte. If the window was truly blocked with zero, you've done a bit of damage, but minimum damage because you're sending only one byte. And presumably most of the time, it will trigger an acknowledgement to be sent. And if the new, when the new acknowledgement comes, you will have a new value of the window size. So this is how TCP works. Now, if we put all those things together, we obtain this diagram. In this diagram, we see all the elements we've seen before, plus the fact that TCP communication is both ways. I always showed so far on the left, a sender on the right, a receiver, but this is not how things are. Quasi all protocols have information in both directions. For example, when you go to the web server, of course, most information is coming from the web server to you, but you still have interaction. You have get request followed by uh, the information you wanted. So here, this is shown by the fact that I see here data that is being sent. So this is the block of data that is being sent, 500 bucks, bytes of data is sent. Here I'm mimicking more or less what you see when you do a TCP dump or Wireshark. And an acknowledgement field and a window size. The acknowledgement and the window size are for the reverse direction. So here, window 6000 is the window that B should use. And 101 is the acknowledgement I am sending to B. So B will reply by hacking the data that is received here, hack 8501, and the window size sent to B, to A, for example, here. Now A sends three packets. We see that the packet is lost, and we see that A sends here a packet that has zero. That means that's a pure acknowledgement. So TCP is allowed and will often send acknowledgement because it receives data, it has nothing to send so it sends simply an acknowledgement, zero data, 
and the field here is giving the acknowledgement and the selective acknowledgement, like we saw before, it's acknowledging everything up to the number here, plus the packet that is out of order that was received here, and the window size that depends on the available space in the socket buffer here. Perhaps a few milliseconds later, the application that is on the B side is sending data. So TCP will send 50 bytes of data. And in a TCP packet, there is always an acknowledgement and a window field. So even if there's nothing new, you still put the acknowledgement, which is the same as before, and the same window because there was no reason to do anything else. And we see here uh, that uh, depending on how the bytes are consumed, the window size evolves as we have explained before. Well, voilà. so this is how TCP works. It uses a sliding window, which makes it much more powerful than stop and go. But this sliding window needs to be done with care. The size itself of the window must be controlled by the destination by sending this window field in order to avoid the buffer overflow. Now, I said that TCP is much smarter than uh, TCP than stop and go. Is this true? At least in the absence of loss, we've seen what in the first week, what is the throughput of, uh, of stop and go. And we've seen that it depended very much on the bandwidth delay product. What is the story for TCP? So in this very simplified academic uh, example, I assume that I have a channel from a S to R and we use a sliding window like TCP is doing. And I assume that the capacity is well-defined, C packets per second. In reality, that's never the case because we're sharing the link between multiple TCP flows or connections. But assume for a second, this number is, is uh, given here. What is the uh, maximum rate at which these red uh, things can be sent here? No, sorry, what is the, not the maximum rate, but what is the window size that is required to be able to fully utilize the capacity of this channel? I close the poll in a few seconds. Closing. And the correct answer is A. To understand the proof, perhaps the simplest is to look at those two diagrams. Here is what happens when the window size is less than C, so that's the number of packets per second, that's the bit rate expressed in packets, uh, times the RTT, the round trip time, so the two way propagation and transmission time. Then we see that if we are below, we send two packets in this case here, but the window is smaller than this, and we are stopped before receiving the acknowledgement here. In contrast, when we are larger than this, then the window allows us to keep going at the rate of the channel. So this is telling us two things. I mean, first, well, it works. It's smarter than stop and go. Stop and go is the primitive way to make a, an exchange reliable. That's what you do when you use UDP. When you use UDP to send one message. You send, you wait for the acknowledgement. And if the acknowledgement doesn't come, you try again. But if you want to be more efficient, if you want to exploit the full capacity of the link between source and destination, you should use a window like TCP is doing and a window that is as large as the bandwidth delay product. So 
The second thing that this tells us is that the window size controls, the, we can view this conversely saying, if I fix the window size, what is the maximum speed at which I can send with this window size given a certain RTT? Then the answer would come from this equality. If I have this now replace C by the speed at which I can send, we see that the width speed at which I can send is W divided by RTT. So by controlling the window size, we can also control the rate at which we are sending. And that's the essential uh, mechanism on which the internet works today. We control the amount of traffic that goes into the internet routers by controlling the window size, the TCP window size of all sources. We'll come back to that in many details in a few more uh, hours here. So that's the, I would say, first approximation of TCP. TCP has hundreds of other elements. We will just discuss a few of them. TCP comes with what is called connections. A TCP connection simply means that before sending data over TCP, you need to do at least one thing, which is to agree on the sequence number. What are the sequence numbers that you, that you use? What is the zero for you and for both directions? Also, you may want to agree on what is the initial, the maximum packet size and a number of other details. So there is what is called a handshake. So before sending data with TCP, sending data is in the blue part here, you typically do this, what is shown here. You send the first TCP packet that contains zero data and it's called a SYN packet. It contains one flag called SYN, SYN for synchronization. And where you start the sequence number, you say, my first number is X. And when you receive this, then that means you can, somebody is trying to connect to you. Therefore, I will uh, acknowledge that and say, yes, I agree to, oh, to connect and my acknowledgement must be acknowledged also. We also send a scene in the reverse direction, which alludes to the fact that originally it was meant that perhaps it's possible to open a connection that works in one direction only. You could send a scene and receive an act that is also not a sin. Nobody does that, but in principle, at the beginning, it was possible. So this is how a TCP connection is open. And you see that on the right-hand side, there is the server, right? Because we see that on the right-hand side, there is the thing that is waiting for things to happen. On the left, there is the client. There is somebody that takes the initiative, send, I say now, I would like to open a TCP connection. So we see that an essential part of this, of this uh, exchange is to give the values of the initial numbers that are X in one direction and Y in the other direction. There is a small anomaly here, a funny thing. Those packets are empty. So when we acknowledge them, we should acknowledge with X. But when it's a SYN packet, we count as if it, there would be one byte. And here the connection is open. We can send data and then we can break the connection. The connection is typically broken in each direction separately because it may happen that you are transferring data from a server. You send a GET request and that's all you have to say. So you finished. You, you will never say anything more to this server. And the server, so, so you can close your part of the connection from you to the server, but the server can not close it yet because there are still data in the pipe. In particular, there might be some data that is lost and will need to be retransmitted. So you close a connection, at least in a graceful way, that's the way here, only when everything has been received. So you have what is called a fin packet, which is an empty packet or uh, with uh, with a uh, Finnish uh, flag here. I mentioned this SYN, FIN, et cetera. Those are all the flags that are in the TCP header. So here we have the IP header, 40 bytes if it's IPv6. TCP like UDP contains a sequence number, uh, a source port and the destination port here. It contains also the a checksum like UDP that will the checksum will detect that anything is wrong here in those numbers. If there's an error, the packet is simply discarded. So it's similar to the 
CRC that is using Ethernet. Then it contains the fields that we said before, the sequence number, which is 32 bit, and the ACK number. So we see that those numbers are very large here. And the window field that we gave here. Then there's a number of uh, things that are not used, like the reserved flow. And the flags, those are the bits here that express whether it's thin or fin. And there are other flags that we will discuss uh, a bit later uh, when we discuss about ECM, congestion control. This has nothing to do with the operation of TCP, but it is put in the TCP header. TCP sockets are a bit more complicated to use than UDP sockets. This is showing on the, on the left a client, on the right a server. So like before on the client side, you open a TCP socket and a TCP socket is always connected. A UDP socket by default is not connected. A UDP socket is a port that is opened on the world and allows you to send to anyone by giving its IP uh, address and port number. A TCP socket requires you to be connected to a specific machine. Because remember, there is this acknowledgement thing. So you need, you cannot just send to someone and then to someone else because you will receive acknowledgements for two different streams. So because of this numbering and this acknowledgement field, it, a TCP requires an association of uh, two machines here. This association is called a connection. Here it's a true connection in the sense that the two ends of the connection know that they are connected here this uh, with this packet that was sent before here at this end of this handshake the two ends of the of the system know that they have received this and so they know that they can start doing this game of the window the axe and the and the sequence numbers unlike with udp even if we have a udp connected socket uh, there is no real association of the two ends Voila, that's all for today. We will continue discovering the beauties and peculiarities of TCP next week.